Welcome, welcome. I can't say how much I, uh, I appreciate you guys being here. Andrew Young. I guess about four years ago, my wife and I went to the World Golf Hall of Fame in St. Augustine. And we played golf, and in the evening we went out to dinner and hanging out, and we walked across this area where there was a plaque that commemorated Andrew Young. Uh, he was there in 1964 to quell all the tension about the civil rights, the impending or potential civil rights bill, and he got beat up by a mob of white people. And he did as, the, as they did then. They, he didn't react to it. He went on and pretty soon that, that incident from history states was a key part of uh, Lyndon Johnson passing the Civil Rights Act. That's just one of the many accomplishments. Of, of this man who's been mayor of Atlanta, the UN ambassador, uh, civil rights icon, my fraternity brother, Alpha Phi Alpha, by the way. Uh, he collaborated with Ernie Suggs, who's also my fraternity brother, Alpha Phi Alpha. <laughs> and they put together this remarkable book um, that I, I'm, I'm sure we will all enjoy. Um, Ambassador, I know you have many, many accolades and awards. You probably get them and throw them in the, in the trash can, but I could, I'd be remiss if I did not present you with something. Um, I guess three years ago, we presented the NBCC Legacy Award to Alice Walker. I think particularly now because of the last tumultuous last two years, we understand the value of acknowledging people while we have that opportunity. And so, I want to present you with the National Book Club Conference's Legacy Award. Thank you. So, um, it's an honor. This someone asked. I think Troy asked me, "How did this come about?" And I was I was made aware of the book just because I'm always looking to, looking to learn about books about us. And I saw the book, and I saw that Ernie was the writer, and Ernie and I were co-workers at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution for many years. He's still one of the finest journalists in the business at the AJC, writing about culture. He's been a fellow. He's done amazing work. And so I reached out to Ernie. He reached out to uh, Ambassador Young's people, and here we are. Within a couple of days or weeks, so it was, it was confirmed. So I was thrilled. Every time we get an author of his magnitude, which we've never had one, actually, but when, when we get a significant, what I would call a coup, you know, it fills me with some, some energy that makes me understand the weekend is going to be wonderful. And this was a, a whole nother level because of the magnitude of who he is. So I'm going to stop talking because I can go on all day. I'm really proud of, of this moment. And I'll let Ernie and, and Ambassador Young take it from here. Thank you so much. Can I start, Ernie? Yeah. Let me start because... Um, you know, one of my few ego trips in life <laughs> was frankly getting my ass beat in St. Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> when, when people ask me, they said, you've been a congressman, a mayor, and a, all of this and that and the other. Uh, what's the most important thing in your life? I thought about it for a long time. And I decided it was an ass whipping on a Saturday night in St. Augustine. <laughs> and the reason was that the Ku Klux Klan had been deputized by the sheriff to beat us up. And we kind of knew that, and Dr. King sent me down there to stop the movement. Because we didn't want people to get beat up for nothing. We knew the Civil Rights Bill was about to pass, and he was afraid that if people got angry and started fighting back and messed up the whole idea of nonviolence, that it would kill the Civil Rights Bill. And when I went down there to stop it, I saw the mob in the park, 
and they were drunk. It was a Saturday night, and um, so I went into the church, and Hosea Williams, with his crazy self, said, Dr. King has sent Andrew Young down here to lead this march. <laughs> I said, oh, shit. <laughs> I said, Jose, that's not what he sent me. He sent me down here to stop the march. He said, Andy, you can't stop these march. You, 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 come on, you, go, you, you got to lead them. I said, okay, let it go out. And I figured I would take them to the corner where there was a parking lot, and they could see a block or two down the street, and they could see they were crazy, drunken Klansmen, and the people would turn around and go back. Cause I said, and I, I said, look, I know you want to march, and you've been marching, you've achieved what you want to achieve. Dr. King has got this bill before the Congress; it'll be passed any day now, and uh, we really do not need to take this march. And I said, but if you insist, I, I have to go with you. And uh, so we prayed. And the problem was, if it had been 25 or 30 men, I wouldn't have had any problem. Because one of the things I learned is, a mob of even 100 white men won't bother 25 black men. But this was mostly women and children. And they loved to pick on women and children. And so when I got through praying, and I said, well, we can go back to the church, or we can go, oh, if you want to march, I have to lead you. And some sister started singing, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. I said, damn. <laughs> These people are about to turn around. So because it was mostly women and children, I marched up on one side of the street, and then I said, you all stay here. And I went across the street to try to talk to the folk. And I, be, I, I really do believe I can talk to the devil if I have to. Uh, and I have tried to. Many devils, uh, all colors. And, um, but this time, I thought I was making progress. And somebody came up behind me and hit me with a blackjack. And then I didn't know what happened. Uh, there's a, pictures in the book, though, of me getting kicked around, and I don't know how long that took place, but when they got tired of kicking me around, I got up, and I said, we can't turn around now. We have to go to the next corner. And the next corner, when they swung at me, I kind of ducked, <laughs> and I didn't get hit. And they tried to kick at me, and I... I was, I was, I was young then, I, I was quick. So they were missing, and I never stopped talking. And then fortunately, the Lord sent a, the biggest policeman I've ever seen. He was about six feet, six inches tall, and he moved through there. And I didn't know this, but the sheriff was the one that was trying to stop the movement. The police chief was they didn't want to mess with St. Augustine's image. And so they were trying to keep it calm. And so this St. Augustine policeman uh, stepped in and said, you all get out of the way and let these people march. Before long, you fool around here and you're going to kill somebody and then you'll really be in trouble. And for him to say that in a police uniform, they backed off. Now. That's not the end of the story, though, because the next Saturday, the Klan had been trying to provoke violence from folks, and they couldn't. People kept on marching, and um, they decided to march through the black community on a Saturday. And we didn't know what was going to happen, because people had been getting beat up and knocked around, and uh, when you come on our turf, I, I didn't know what what was going to be the case. The other thing is, the men had not been marching. And they might get brave in their own community uh, and start something, and we did not need that. But when the Klan came down in all of their regalia, 
their ha pointed hats and white sheets. And I, we knew that under those sheets they had their guns and they were looking for a fight. And the same people that had been getting beat up for months uh, started singing, I love everybody. I love everybody in my heart. I feel the love of Jesus. I feel the love of Jesus in my heart. That's why I love everybody. I love everybody in my heart. I said, good God Almighty, these are wonderful people. And that's the, the contrast between them cussing and hollering and breaking bottles and uh, making all kinds of nasty noise. And when they walk through the black community down uh, in Lincolnville, people start singing, I love everybody. And the contrast between their hatred and violence and the love and the peace and the forgiveness of black people uh, really changed this country. Now that didn't get into the newspapers very much. A lot of people don't know about it because, you know, Bloody Sunday got in the newspapers. It was on Sunday and it was prime time in the news. But Saturday nights in St. Augustine and every other night was uh, very little covered because when the press came down, they beat up the press. And, uh, but that was the day that for me, nonviolence proved that it was the most powerful way to bring about changes in this nation. That being able to sing, I love everybody, and that I feel the love of Jesus in my heart. Now that's what this book is about. This book is about my life, which is, I mean, excuse the expression, I don't know, very few white folks and no niggas at all been as blessed as me. <laughs> I mean, I was blessed, and, um, I, I, I did what I was supposed to do, and I went where I was supposed to go, and it always worked out better than I could have planned. And so in trying to tell that, I told it, I wrote a book, uh, the title of it was An Easy Burden, uh, and it came from the, the verse in the Bible where Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And for me, because of the Spirit of God moving in this movement, it really was easy. And uh, I, I, I don't know how long they kicked me around and beat me, uh, but I didn't even have a headache. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, it was amazing to me uh, that we were able to, and, and you know, I, I can remember an old lady you see, it was women and children. The men wouldn't, wouldn't march. They say they can't be nonviolent. And I say, bullshit. You ain't been violent. White folks have been beating on you all your life. You know, they've been picking on your mama and your sister, your brother, uh, and you've never done anything but say, I ain't, can't be nonviolent. You're damn nonviolent. You're not doing anything. That's why we've, I'm gonna quit preaching. I, I just got started, but that's why this year is still a critical part of the movement. And what's happened uh, in Kansas last week was women taking over. See? And women changed the politics of Kansas. And it's going to be women, black and white, that immigrant uh, people who were born here who are going to help this country understand that you have got to respect women. Now I'm going to say one more little fresh thing and then I'll quit and you uh, burn, I mean, uh, Ernie. I said women, men don't understand what abortion is. They hear miscarriage but they don't ever go to the hospital to find out what, what the agony a woman's going through. They don't know the, the pain of carrying a baby 
you know, for six, seven, eight months, and then having that baby not be able to survive. Uh, and uh, I said, one, I, I wish we get somewhere, uh, women take over a state legislature, and they vote to say that no man can get married unless he's been circumcised. <laughs> And then, then men would realize, no, they ain't gonna cut off my, 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 my stuff. <laughs> you know, but, but uh, we really don't know. And that's why I think of you as a blessing. And I'm proud of myself, for, proud of you for inviting me here and coming here. And the other miracle is that uh, you read. And... Um, I, I was turning 90 in March, and it must have been January or February, and uh, a lady standing in the back there against the post, Amanda Brown Armstein, uh, suggested maybe we ought to have a coffee table book. And I said, I don't like coffee table books with no writing in it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice to have pictures, but there ought to be a narrative. and so. Um, Ernie Suggs has been covering uh, my life for how many years? 25, 25 years here in Atlanta. And um, <laughs> we, we've known each other. We've been through some of the same sort of things. And so I talked to him, and he recorded. And what took us 500 pages to do in a book where it was just reading and writing. Uh, in this book, with the pictures, the narrative is a lot shorter. Uh, but it's still, with the pictures, you get a really good feel for what the Civil Rights was, Movement was all about. You see the pictures of the many, many people whose names we will never know. I remember their faces and I can remember what they did, but I can't remember their names even because there were so many what I call saints, saints of rank and file that the Lord laid his hand on and they did heroic things. They risked their lives, they got their houses shot up, uh, and we should never forget that this movement really took over this nation after the Second World War. And we are what we are here in Atlanta. I mean, Atlanta was a totally segregated city when the war was over. And uh, between 1960 and now, we have really, well, for one thing, we were just, um, we were about a half a million people. And now we're over five million. And, um, most of that has happened under the leadership of black mayors. And if you go through the airport, uh, say, how did this airport get built? Well, you know, it was built with no government money. It was built with Wall Street money. And um, so no taxpayers paid for it. Uh, and it pays for itself. Uh, and. Uh, not many cities in the, I don't think there's any other city in the world that runs quite the way we run. And so that's why we're glad to have you here. Uh, the fact that you come here from out of town to our conventions is one of the ways we keep this hotel and all, all the rest of them filled. And we had the Olympics and the Super Bowl and there's always something going on here uh, that uh, that you are a part of and I want to say thank you and God bless you. That was a great way to start this. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm Ernie Suggs, the, the uh, writer of the book. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm Ernie Suggs, I'm the author of the book, and uh, if you all have looked through it, thank you. 
Um, the way we divided the book up, and this, I want to ask this question to the ambassador. The way we divided the book up, as you'll see in the chapters, is that is the book is called The Many Lives of Andrew Young. And what I tried to do with the book is chronicle each life of this man. So we start, you know, growing up in New Orleans, going to Howard University, a prestigious college, one of the most prestigious, college, prestigious colleges in the country, um, becoming a, a pastor of a church in Georgia, uh, becoming a civil rights leader, to becoming the first in the first class of black uh, elected congressman from the South since Reconstruction, uh, to becoming the UN ambassador, to becoming the mayor of Atlanta, to becoming the person who uh, brought the Olympics to uh, Atlanta, and who built this city. You know, all the construction that's going on now is uh, remnants of what he did as the mayor, uh, to becoming a philanthropist and you know doing what he's doing now with the, Atlant the Andrew Young Foundation. So my question to you is with all these lives that I write about in the book, when you look in the mirror, you talked about you're 90 years old, obviously. Uh, when you look in the mirror, who is Andy Young? Damn if I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, I do know. I'm, I'm the child my grandmama sat on her knee and um, taught me about the Lord. And uh, when she lost her sight, she made me read the Bible to her and the newspaper. And uh, incidentally to that, um, I had to figure out what the number was that day because she liked to play the numbers. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I just feel like I am one blessed young man. And uh, I, could, I, I couldn't want for any more. I, I always did want for more. I wanted to be tall enough to play basketball, and I was short. But my daddy was short, so I knew I wasn't going to be but so tall.